let's start with your early childhood. Uh, my childhood? I was, um, I was born in London, or actually an area of London called Croydon, um, just after the Second World War, or 1953. So, so I'm a new Elizabethan, really. Hmm. Uh, but you have to remember, uh, from quite a big family, quite a, and also a working class family, where um, money was not an a easy thing. We were quite a poor family. But uh, my father was a very active um, amateur singer. He loved to sing. And so um, I learned to play the piano and accompany my father, basically. So I got more and more interested in um, backstage work. We were very lucky because <coughs> our amateur group was very professional in their outlook. And we um, performed at the local professional theatre, which is called the Ashcroft Theatre in Croydon. Mm -hmm. And through doing the amateur work, I then managed to get casual work, doing get-outs and get-ins and helping on um, on productions that were professional coming on tour. So I, st I started doing things like the pantomime season as a daemon and electrician, or a follow spot operator, or a dresser. So I got to do quite a lot of that sort of thing, and an awful lot of repertoire before I went to RADA. And I, I can't remember exactly why I chose to apply to RADA. I think it's probably because it's the only drama school I have ever heard of. So, And that's mainly because I've been working with actors who say, oh, you should go to RADA or something. So, but uh, my, my, both my parents were very sceptical. They didn't think that uh, there was any chance in hell of getting into RADA. So um, no one was more surprised when I... Also, my school wasn't interested. They didn't have a, a careers master that's... Um, but then I applied for RADA. In those days, RADA was a four-term course, each with five students. So there were no more than 20 students in the entire building. The philosophy in those days was for stage management were in servitude to the actor, basically. That's now, thankfully, very different. And I was thinking it was, it was a great place to find these things out, to experiment, to, to make mistakes, to see what the lights did. Of course, it was a very different industry in those days because it was a bit more you could hit everything with a hammer and make it work. It had no problem. You'd turn the gas pressure up, that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> but um, now it's much more sophisticated. But it sort of it was at the naissance of what was becoming the lighting designer's role in the show. This was all new. So we were starting, especially when it comes to equipment, what, what was being manufactured at the time. I remember when RADA got its first computer lighting board. Mm. That was a complete, you know, revelation, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Mm. Totally and utterly, and that sort of thing. So we were, um, you know, the, you learnt through the job, basically. And then, so and then RADA was a very holistic, because you, um, you, you grew to understand how a production was put together. You understood all the roles that everybody had to do from stage management through to wardrobe to the workshop everything because you had a go at doing all those things while you were at RADA so you came out very um, very equipped I think to do many jobs basically and in those days they say I was very lucky to be introduced by the head of RADA into um, Glyndebourne and uh, again, it was a so happy stance. I didn't, I, it was nothing to do with me. I was just told I had an interview. Mm. And I went along to this interview and um, I didn't get the job I went for, which was a stage management job. But I, they did notice my interest in lighting and there was a vacancy in the lighting department at Glyndebourne, which turns out to be, again, the most, one of the most happiest things that ever happened to me, basically. Um, so I then did, I say, about 20 years at Glyndebourne on the staff there as the uh, in the lighting department, mainly as an electrician initially, but then as a, a lighting manager later on and relighting productions on tour and that sort of thing. Sir so Peter Hall, one Thursday, said, "I need a lighting designer for Sunday. Can you do it?" And of course he said, "Couldn't say no, could you?" So, you th and that, that's the show that gave me my West End debut and my Broadway debut. So all these things were, you know. That's no, Orpheus. Yeah. Orpheus descending, yes. Mm. Sorry, an all star, all star cast with um, you know, Vanessa, headed by Vanessa Redgrave and Paul Freeman. So uh, uh, you learnt your craft at Glyndebourne. I mean, you obviously started at Rada, but it's a short course at that time. So yeah, absolutely, you, you really learnt your lighting. Yeah, you know, one one learnt. Well, no, one started lighting. I mean, it's mm. the first time I'd actually put a lighting plot together. So you said that was Oedipus, you said a double bill of Oedipus, Oedipus, Oedipus and Oedipus Rex and Oedipus Colonus, yeah. yes, with two different directors. Yeah. 
again, one of the, and also when I did my fifth term at um, Rada, yeah. I lit for Eve Shapiro on Othello, right. and a musical, Little Mary Sunshine, starring yeah. Alan Rickman as Big Gin Kenyon, or whatever it is. <laughs> Who directed that? Eve Shapiro. As you have said that you come from the middle class family, mm -hmm. when you choose this career, you went, you went to Rada, whether this was a career choice or you're following your passion? I would say I always wanted to be in theatre. I had two passions at that time. One was to be um, a farmer. I, was, my, I had an uncle who was a farmer and I really enjoyed working on the farm. Uh, and very strangely, I acquiesced to my parents' wishes when they said, when they I applied to RADA, and they said, well, you've got to have a second string to the bow. Mm. Uh, you mustn't just ex expect to get into RADA. So I, that same week, I had uh, an interview for uh, the Farmer's Weekly newspaper. Okay. And the very morning I was meant to gone to the Farmer's Weekly newspaper interview, mm. I got my acceptance letter from RADA. Mm. <laughs> So it was like the cavalry coming up. But no, I always, um, I enjoyed theatre and I always liked um, going to the theatre. And I, I'd be interested in doing anything. But um, Why was it light? Why, why aren't you a sound designer or a designer or a costume maker? or What, what, what happened at RADA? Because you didn't go there thinking to be a lighting person. No, not at all. So what, what was, can you remember the moment or the sequence of moments? What, what was it that grabbed you about that area? It happens at Rada, people come for the course and they fall in love with a thing they've not thought of. Well, it's, I don't really know. I think it's something about being in a darkened space and you turn a light on and suddenly the space is transformed. And, it, and then you could do wonderful things like put gobos in or colour and things or someone could be walking in that space. I mean, I used to love the GBS because in those days it was a pros theatre and it was mm. very tall because the, the mm. fly tower went up and you could put a light source, even an old little pattern 23 from a long way away mm. and just put an actor. I remember because it was Alan Rickman's term that we were mm. working with and it, um, it was just an amazing thing to see these actors in the space and there were all exciting things you could do I mean, and you could, you could express all sorts of things in terms of space and time and direction that it was just a very exciting thing to do basically and now as they all as they reinvent the industry and in the last 20 years alone the industry has changed beyond recognition with the technology that's now available it's just phenomenal what you can do but i have to say i i probably benefit from having been through all the nuts and bolts of the old industry to appreciate how you can use the new things better i think modern light and designs coming in who now automatically put up a a lighting fixture because they can and it can do all sorts of things like so the whole business of having to plan exactly what color something will be in where it was going to hang how many of those you've got so you can play with that, that planning process doesn't gone away I still use that now uh, in my my planning process for a new production so when you went went to Rada and you started getting this formal education yeah in theatre so how did that broaden your view about theatre and technicality of theatre? Well, it is about process, I think. There is a process where... And Rada also gave you the opportunity of understanding the process. And I mean that from the actor's point of view, the director's point of view, the designer's point of view, the workshop's point of view, the wardrobe's point of view, how all those things come together in an organised way in order to create what you do in the end. I, I never see myself as... I see myself just as part of that process. And you don't ever come out of a production, a successful production, saying, well, the lighting was great, the rest of it was crap. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a chemistry. It's a way that you form all these elements together. And when the chemistry is right, it can be fantastic. If you've got the right actor, in the right light, in the right costume, you know, and with the right attitude, you know, it, it's these things are magical. I, mean, I, I always think it's one of my, the best parts of my job because I get to sit in a dark theatre at nine o'clock on a Monday morning with Maggie Smith in this corner and Judy Dench in that corner, giving performances for me in you know, in rehearsal. And each is a, is a you know, they can be amazing in their craft to see that craft under the process they go through in which to achieve these things. It's, um, you know, I'm part of that process. I think Rada was able to focus that 
in many ways, into a, a, a reason thing. But I, that was my basis. And also because at that time it was so all embracing. You, I mean, you, there were some days where you, um, you went and hid from the night security man. So he would come round, do his locking up rounds, and you'd be hiding on the fly floor or something. And then you would sneak out and still be working in the prop room all night. Because it, A, you had a lot to do, but B, it was a passion. You didn't want to stop. Do you think this process of self-learning is far better than the process that now your structured teaching is there? So which one I, is thing I is think better? it's the only way. I think you can be given the, uh, the basics, yes. the information. But then it's up to you then to go out and see how you use that, basically. So what's happening now in the industry, in the modern industry, is there are very, it's becoming very specialized in various areas. So you, the idea of being a programmer for a control system, like Grand MA or EOS or something, there is now a career path where people just do <coughs> programming, ultimately, or um, production electricians, where because all the equipment is now so sophisticated, you have to know it. You can't just bash in mm -hmm. and it has to be really planned out as to how these things. And, and I would say, on the big projects like Lord of the Rings or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, all those big musicals, you 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 can't start unless you have the team you want with you. I mean. You, because they all have their strengths in the areas they work. Like I can't be responsible for how it's put together, mm -hmm. or how you staff it, how you manage it, how you finance it. All these things mm -hmm. are now such specialised area. When I started, you had the all. I would normally rig the lights and probably focus them as well as lighting and operate the lighting board. Mm -hmm. But that I can't do that now because it's so. You could almost teach everything at that point. You could teach all the available kit. Mm -hmm. You could teach entirely. The entirety of how a control worked, yeah. because sometimes it was just the levers, but now you can only go so far in, in, in teaching because the student then has to pick it up themselves and go on and on and on developing and understanding layers okay. and layers of it. Because I think it, it is to a certain <coughs> extent, and the reason I, do, I, I really don't do any formal teaching of lighting design, unlike um, Neil here, I, I always, I can only think you could learn, I only go and do a project, so anyone mm. on that project can be part of the creation of that production and ask questions while we're doing it. And, I, mm. and that's all I ever did. I only was, mm. and also, see, I think it's important, you, I don't think you can graduate from RADA and then say, I'm a lighting designer and that's all I'm going to do. You have to then start on the bottom of the next ladder, getting experience from the various mm. areas by getting jobs as I don't know, anything, basically, mm -hmm. uh, from the bottom working out. It seems to me that the kids that now are doing wonderfully well at getting jobs, aren't they? In terms of, mm -hmm. you know, but they're not necessarily as lighting designers. They're like dad. No, going no, to, I mean, they still come in with the expectation they're going to start, you know, halfway from yeah, higher sure. up the ladder. And actually, a little bit sometimes some of them do now, in a funny way. More so that than, than they have to. A lot of them do still have to go at the bottom and assist, but some people jump in. Mm. I mean, the teaching, as I spoke to you before, is still about giving a person an, an opportunity to try their skill or practice their craft and then critiquing it more than anything else. It's, it's not very different from the way Paul describes taking projects, leading projects. It is still about, you do it. You do it. We'll comment on it. We'll say, why did you do that? We'll say, you know, the idea behind that is so-and-so. That's the theory of backlight or that's... Yeah. That, you know, I think that you know one one window gobo suggests a gobo, two window gobos next to each other suggests there's a wall, mm. and it's much more you know mm. you know depends what you're doing. So you 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 put ideas in people's heads, mm. perhaps, but you still their learning is their experience. And the, it, the worst thing any student can do at Radu is is think what would Neil do? How would Neil light it? Or how would Paul light it? Mm. No no no. How would you do it? Not how would we do it? But how to know that is right or wrong? When you imagine the things as a designer? Well, you do it, and if it goes wrong, you know that's not to do next time. It's a learning process. It, I mean, it really is a learning process. It's, um, but it's developing an aesthetic. You, you, you have an opinion about what you think looks good. It's a slightly cultural thing, I should think, as well, isn't it? Because where, where you were born and brought up, and the, the means you were given to do these things, it's, it's a different thing wherever you are in the world. Mm. But it's all, it all can be used to that to that you know, your personal experience, I, I think, anyway. And in the, this world of Google, we are all new designers are you know, from 
whenever they start designing something, they first Google all these <laughs> things. And you have been from that era where there was no Google. Now your process has changed in this? this my way. process, I don't think, has changed. I think uh, information, we see around it. Look, my, my, I have books on my bookshelves. <laughs> <laughs> they all... Um, I know I've been I've been lighting now what forty years so it's a it's a process it's something. How like, do you get the new ideas for every time? So, so what the uh, reference points are from your life you're reading and what the kind of shows and films that you're seeing. Now the student are not getting those inputs. No, they're not. So they're, 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 I, this, I find this a problem. Yes, I, I think they're not coming as yeah, a as a complete yes person. They, yes. They're seeing it as, as they tend to think of lighting as something that you can do yes. and it does have and I think one of their biggest criticisms now is that they'll do a design and they won't think about what they're designing you have to gauge where you're doing the project who for for what money how much time you can give to it because you know, they're always squeezing the amount of money you're paid and things um, how much budget you have in order to do the job in the time with the people you're being given to do. So you try every time to make the best of what it's a logistic thing, ultimately. All the initial decisions, because you, you could only design so much to be done if it's a tour going out on the road that has to load in on Monday morning for a performance at 7.30 on Monday evening. So you, you've only got that much of day to build the set, focus the lights, light the show and have a show. So that automatically informs how much you can do. And when you're you know, designing a play, like, like designing a play, what's your underlying idea? If you'll get a job, the first thing you think about, well, is can I, what can I contribute to this play or what, what, what they want to do? You, you try and balance what, it's about balancing the ambitions of the director, the, the company you're working for, um, the designer. All those ambitions have to be distilled into what is practical. But and if, my, I see my job as providing what is best for that show. And that's done, but on different levels of uh, what's available. I mean, all, all, those, all those practical things, time, money, personnel, because it's, it's part of a process. It's part of the, the whole. Every director I know, 99%, on when you're going, will say, it's just a stagger through. It's, an, it's, not, it's not a full resume. Yeah. I've seen, like you have, some mind-blowing... You feel it's just for you. It's a wonderful thing. Most my most emotional moments have been in a totally unlit space watching a rehearsal oh, yeah. because you're investing all your interest in that, and they go, "Oh, it's not, it's not ready. Well, it really, this is so ready." It's I fantastic. remember going into one rehearsal and it was, a, it was doing a three-hander. There were three one-act plays. There was something called Talking Heads, yeah. and it was uh, one particular one was Maggie Smith. It was just one performer, yeah. Maggie Smith, yeah. doing a monologue with Alan Bennett directing. Yeah. Yeah. In this rehearsal room in Chichester at nine o'clock in the morning, doing a run through of Better Mount Lentils. And you come to the end of that rehearsal thinking, what on earth can I bring to make that any better? Because that mm. was just perfect. Mm. You, know, you just want someone to come mm. in and to see that, you know, because mm. she is amazing. Mm. But, um, but you know, it, it, it's, it's something you never get used to. I don't think you could ever say this is going to, you, you can never enter, it's always a big thing to move into that first day of rehearsal when the actors and costumes and sets and lights all come together for the first time because it's the only time you see that. You know, set designers can build models, costume designers can draw pictures of and you, and you spend hours fitting but the lighting designer is the last element of that and it's the most pressurized because you can only do your work with all those elements working together and, 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 the, and the pressure changes with which on the scale of whatever you're doing. So if you're doing something at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, mm. or if you're doing something at the Dorfman or you know, studio space in Birmingham, it's still the same pressure. You have to, you have to put your goods on out there. It is, it is a, uh, I would say a very mercurial process. And it, when it works, great. Mm. When it doesn't work, uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> but there is no, there's no one way. There is really no one way to approach this. And it's all about personality. It's about your personality. It's about the director's personality. And somebody else can come in, into the project and light it totally differently. But it's, it's just, a, you know, that's also what makes it so interesting and life-enhancing because you are always out there. And it's a, it, can be a, it can be a scary thing, can't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you would be 
lighting the same production in two different setting or two different uh, media but if you lighting in one production for a big commercial from say rada student production mm -hmm. so where your personality would be more visible your signature uh -huh. style would be more visible <coughs> good question that's a very good question isn't it? um well, again, that's all part of the process. You, you would, I mean, like, so for instance, doing Hamlet. We're doing Hamlet next. Is yeah, but it, that would be my fifth Hamlet, I think, both in terms of Shakespeare and mm -hmm. the opera. So I've got did Hamlet in Vienna on the opera, Hamlet in Sweden, mm -hmm. the opera, and then I did two national theatre, no, one national theatre of Hamlet, and with people like Ben Wishaw, did Trevor, and Nunn. did Trevor Nunn's very <coughs> short one I did. Some Russell Beals. That was a beautiful piece of luggage. So the, there is a bit of luggage coming with me mm -hmm. to this Hamlet because I don't quite understand our director's point of view. And I certainly don't understand the way he's cast it because he's changed characters and he's changed sex, he's changed ethnicity, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really make sense in many ways. And I don't, I, I have to say, I was told you, I was disappointed the way. It, been designed because I just think that limits you. Yeah. And the whole idea, I would, I was much more excited about the idea of an empty black space to which yeah. we brought this thing. So it's quite a good play for that as well, isn't it? Or some well, it is. It's my mind. To do in an empty black but that's space, because but. I don't think. A, <coughs> well, we did. I did talk to. I didn't actually say no. Scrap the set. There's mm. still an empty space. But that was how it was sold to me. Yeah. And I was more excited by having an empty space. Mm. Which is just the, me and the actor. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I'm not as as enthusiastic about this Hamlet because what they're going to do, I, I can't. They aren't giving me the scope to express more spatial yes. things. Well, once the set goes, I think we can do more with the open space. But um, so it's, it, it's, yeah, it's more but it is about reacting mm -hmm. to the same play yes. in a different edition. Again, mm -hmm. they, there's a different edition of the play. Even. Yes. I mean, they've mm -hmm. cut the play to such a degree that yes. so many things... It's like last night, I saw an adaption of Hamlet and a brand new commissioned opera at Glyndebourne last night. Mm -hmm. But you, you would bring all those component experience to and try and interpret mm -hmm. what the director wants. That's mm -hmm. the thing, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is there was a, there's a, big, a big debate. We had a big uh, debate after the last uh, associational lighting design meeting about is light um, art or craft. Right. Yes. And I'm I'm actually people were some people were saying well you know I'm an artist mm. I'm an artist mm. Mm. I don't quite see that I would say I'm much more of a craftsman. Well, because craftsman it's it, 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 we mustn't get that wrong. A craftsman is a hugely skilled um, specialist. Mm. And craftsmen make beautiful things yeah. and learn how to do that over long, long apprenticeships. And so sometimes people say, oh, craft, you know. Craft but is, is it just... art? Is it art? Since uh, you have been doing so many years and now you are finding that you are more of a craftsman than an uh, artist. That's what you are implying? I, 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 don't see my, I don't see myself as an artist. I see myself as a craftsman. Like, does anyone bother like to work with a director who knows lighting well? Or the director who probably leave it to the light designer. Well, it's look <laughs> <laughs> interesting question. But I'm just about to do a production where the, where the director actually does sometimes light his own show. So I'm a bit wary of him, and he's um, Argentinian. So I don't know. He's quite. But um, hmm. no, I certainly because I have relationships with certain directors mm -hmm. like um, Peter Hall or Trevor Nunn or Sam Mendes who know what I do and tend to leave me completely and utterly alone okay. and only come to me if they have an issue with something, which is very rare. Uh, but there are other directors who I think are either unsure of what they're doing or what they're producing. They're not sure within themselves what they're doing. So they will interfere and they think, well, that's not working because the writing's wrong, which couldn't be further from the truth. In being, you should direct it better or yeah. that actor yes. should do act it better. Mm. But that I can't do it, you know, apart from turn the light off, which will be, you know, probably a good thing in some cases. But um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a sticky situation. That's why I'm always very wary about working with a new director for the first time, because mm -hmm. you haven't established that trust or knowledge about what we're each able to do. Coming to the techniques of lighting and trying to keep changing, and London being, being such a big place, there must be many trends that keep going on. 
and so many old production, old production rules. <laughs> That's why I employ many younger assistants, so yes. they can tell me what's out there now in the industry. Okay. It's impossible to keep up. Yes. Absolutely impossible. Uh, the way that new equipment is engendered now, and, and you, it's, it's 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 impossible. You know, you can only go to some of these big shows like Plaza, mm. or and, you know, also I get very bored standing and looking at a light. Because it doesn't mean anything, but uh, and occasionally, but you tend most of the lighting designers will see something and you hear through the grapevine, mm -hmm. gosh, you must go into because Robe have got this thing now, or mm -hmm. that's something that's really worth looking at. But um, for instance, I'm dependent on the boy you met the other day, Tom Young, came in. Mm -hmm. I just had lunch with him because I want to take him to Copenhagen with me because mm -hmm. we've got a particular system whereby we've got very little space left to us in the design mm -hmm. to deliver. Well, it's two things. It's noise, colour, and versatility. And that all comes out of LED these days. And I don't know enough about LED, whereas he does. He's doing X Factor. He oh, yeah, knows exactly. every yeah. LED fixture out there. So he's coming. And he's also going to help me choose gear in order to... Mm. Oh, and also know how to program it on a, on a grand demo. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't do that without him. But this new trend where uh, light designer, this uh, programmer, then there's head electrician and so mm -hmm. many people are working in this lighting field. So do you think this trend is going to help designer? They will be more able to focus more on lighting, designing light than this rigging and other programming part of it? I almost felt completely uh, divorced from the technical side of things because it was too vast. There were however many universes of DMX, radio mm -hmm. dimmers, other, other things going on. That they were too much for me to take on board myself and I would you would have how you, you you would say what you'd like to achieve and various people would get my assistant or anything will go away and suggest well there is this unit that we could have here that would do that and be able to do that and which I hadn't seen so the equipment comes as through a suggestion of somebody else but then also how you program those things you know I was the first generation of when I was a blind born being an electrician mm -hmm. That's when computer boards came. In fact, Glyndebourne was the first place to have the MMS system, the old strand MMS, and we were taught up on that. Memory system. Hmm? Modular memory system. The modular memory system. Yes, and that that then became the naissance for the Galaxy, mm -hmm. through to the 500 series, until the strand then just died. And of course, then the whole operating philosophy of control has changed with EOS and ETC. Mm -hmm. And now, I don't even know how to turn a grand MA on. I've no idea. Let alone how to oh, program so, so it. And yet, the Tom, it's like watching a yeah, shorthand yeah. typist. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you find this useful for the designers? Because now designer can solely focus on designing part of this their job. Well, you just have to have an extremely good relationship with the programmer. You need to have brought them on board to the idea to what you're actually trying to achieve. Okay. And so that becomes part. You know, that's your that's your left hand. That your left arm is your programmer. Your right arm is your production electrician okay. and you're, you're in the middle but they, they you can't, I can't do anything without the left and the right so it's, it becomes uh, you know we well, become one per well, you, in an ideal world you become one person because they all know what you're trying to achieve they will go they will do what's necessary and, I, and the reason I choose the individuals I do work with is because they will do that they'll take on board exactly where we're going what I'm thinking of trying to achieve how they do it I don't know and the production attrition will go away and make sure everything is in position and working well in order to achieve that as well. So I can't do that. So And he has a team anyway, of because you need 20 electricians nowadays to do that sort of thing. And, you know, it's sort of... it's a, it's you, you do sometimes feel a bit divorced from the process because of that. But it is a very... Sort of, the, yeah. the number of nights you will find me here in this office on that drawing board. Mm drawing away thinking, what the hell do I do now? I don't know. I mean, because it's, uh, mm. you're working in two dimensions and you're looking at a plan mm -hmm. and you think, well, it's, and you're trying to work it into three dimensions and... Yeah, but the thing is that we, we're trying to understand it, that the way you are working and in the meantime, you said so much change has taken place. Mm. And oh, now, yes. now you're working with a team. Earlier you were more or less with one chief tactician and you were there. That is the yeah. modern way of doing things. Or on, so, on, on most shows. Most so shows. Would, uh, if you have to design a play which is for special occasion and there are only few shows has to be, few performances has to be done, say, say four performances has to be done, and there is one opera show which probably may go on for years. 
So would you design the same way? No, I do. It's, it's, uh, we have an expression uh, in English called "horses for courses." You just design it for that, for the for the parameters you're given. Okay. Every every, every project, you have to look at it from no, where, that perspective. I mean, I mean to say, when you, when you know that some production has to go on for years, probably you will play, play it safe with your lighting. And when you know only four performances has to be done, you <coughs> can be a little more experimental. Well, because I do a lot of opera. Opera tends to be. Uh, a planned well ahead in advance. Uh, any new production is either then either lent out to other opera houses yes. or it's in the repertoire of that house mm. for at least two or three revivals, whether it's the Metropolitan Opera mm. or I don't know, anywhere, Sydney or whatever. So you, um, but you are also plugged into their system because the opera house has its own way of doing things and they, they give you your entire support network mm -hmm. and after you've done the show it becomes their responsibility mm -hmm. to look after when it's revived and things. You get very rarely invited back to the Opera House or the Bolshoi or whatever because <clears throat> it's just in their system and they will continually revive those things uh, forever. It's not from the production or the director side yeah. and as a light designer when you know that your production probably will be run, on, run for years you probably would like to play safe but when you know only four performances are there, probably you may, may take more risk. That's what I'm saying. Is is this how? No, you, I mean, it, I'm trying to do the best yeah, job. Part, part of that job is to get what you want. Yes. And a lot of the time, when you're in established organizations like the Royal Opera or the National mm -hmm. Theatre, where people have been working their day in, day out, mm -hmm. you, you need to then push them mm -hmm. to be able to create. I mean, the, the, the modern philosophy now of any organ, big organisation is to keep everything fresh. You must try and re-educate all your workers, even if they've been there for 30 years. They must now know how to do all these new things, so send them on courses and things. It can be difficult because some, some people don't want to change. I don't want to change, really. I don't like change, but it's you go in knowing that you're going to have to push for something to happen because they're not used to doing it or it'd be too much like hard work or and it's pushing those but you, but you not to know how far you can push them both in terms of finances and in personnel and personality